the same one. Mouse doesn't seem to like this. Well, Chris can push buttons. Okay, Chris, can you be Which my one? official? Uh, if I hit the uh, just a spacebar or okay, spacebar. Yeah, spacebar will advance <coughs> or enter key will advance or any of the arrows will advance. Do we want to get off in a hurry and get moving fast? 
or do we want to stretch the ride and hang on to that piston as long as we possibly can? So we're going to look at how to optimize that and figure out the right balance. Next slide, please. So the project goal here, we're going to look at three most commonly used model or motor options to us for the U.S. team in FAI competition. We're not interested in helping the Belarusians or the Spanish or the Russians or whatever like that. Okay? We're selfish here. So we're going to look at the three most commonly used motors and try and dial in for you the optimum piston configurations for each of those three motors. Next slide. <coughs> Three motors that we're looking at. Top one there is an Estes A3. Now that's not widely used in the internet because that's the only one of these things that's commercially available to us. It's a good practice motor. It helps us dial in the models. And its thrust curve is a little bit nastier and harder. So if we can survive on an A3, then we're confident that we're going to survive on the, the harder to get and better performing motors potentially that we're going to use in the internet. The other two motors is an Apogee A2, and while it's not commercially available anymore and certified, there are enough stashes out there that it's conceivable that it's a viable option for the US team. And the last one at the bottom is the Ultra motor. That's unobtainable and unusable to us in the US, but that's what we most commonly use in the internets. Uh, you buy them over there, you ship them over there, yeah, that's what our competitors use. So we obtained a small supply of those donated by, I think, Trip Barber or somebody like that from the US team tested those as well. Next slide, please. Now this slide I'm going to stay on for a minute because it's very important that you understand what's going on here. Because this slide goes, uh, is a common approach we're going to use in analyzing the rest of the motors. The blue line at the bottom you'll see, that is the baseline thrust curve of the motor without a piston. Now the rocket scientists in the audience are going to look at that and say, well wait a minute, the thrust curve is spiking. There's a big kick at the front, and then it tapers off and you have a long burn. Well, look at the time scale. We're going out to eight one hundredths of a second. The thrust curve on the normal motor is well outside of that. The model has left the piston at 75 one hundredths. So the normal thrust curve is after that occurs. The red line is the piston adjusted thrust. That's what the piston has added above the nominal thrust of the motor. So there's a huge thrust spike very early, well earlier than the motor would have kicked the thrust spike on its own. And that thrust spike is almost 40 newtons. The A3 comes in at about 78. So you can see the effect of what that piston is doing. The second thing on there I want to call your attention to is that it goes below zero out there to the right. You see a little, like a sine curve. That's the effect of a bounce back. That piston is getting kicked and moving so fast that we're not sure why, but we're contending that possibly the gases of the motor are not capable of keeping up by filling that volume. So you got this little dance or trade-off point where the piston is trying to move and the motor is trying to keep up with it. And at the bottom where we go into negative, the motor is potentially losing that battle. The piston is actually hurting the performance there, not helping. So the optimum looking at that curve is where you first cross from above zero to negative. And that's at about 29 centimeters in this case. So looking at that graph, we said any piston longer than 29, you're actually hurting yourself, not helping yourself. Next slide, please. So what we tried to do is see what we could do to offset that bounce back. The first thing we did was add volume. Instead of piston resting directly on the motor, we put six centimeters, uh, four centimeters, six centimeters. We got out on the next slide to eight centimeters of initial volume to try and dampen that thrust spike. And as you see, going from the red, green to purple, it gets a little better. We're delaying that initial thrust spike, and as we delay it, it's softening it. It still doesn't quite get us there, though. So press next slide, please. So now we went to eight centimeters, more, more, and most. And comparing the six to the eight, you can see the red to the blue. We have delayed the spike really softened it, and on the blue line, we have never gone negative. Thank you, sir. So we've essentially solved that problem now by adding initial volume. Instead of just standing the motor on top, we put a little bit of space in there to give the motor time to fill that initial volume and start moving the piston. Next slide, please. Now, the next thing we tried to do, because that delays the spike, and one of our other goals was get her moving, get her up, and get her done. We went with a smaller diameter piston. We choked it down from 13 millimeter to 10. 
And you can see on the blue line that reflects that, that's brought the thrust spike back in, and that's a much nicer looking curve. We're still not going negative. We've softened that blow. We've, extended, we've got the best of both worlds there. We're extending the benefit for the whole duration. And we're softening that thrust spike. And we're getting that thrust spike soon. So that's the best of both worlds. Next slide, please. So now we're going to look at the A to, or the, uh, the 10 millimeter motors, the A2s. And this is just bizarre. It blew us away. This is reflecting a 68 inch long piston. Nobody in their right mind is thinking of flying an A2 on a 68-inch piston. There's no thrust spike on the front end of that. And at 172 centimeters, when the piston is shot out the back end, not only is it still adding impulse, but it's increasing. So what that tells us is that 172 centimeters isn't long enough. We didn't test any further than that because it's not practical to build and fly that. There's a hard limit in any art competition in two meters. Next slide, please. And this is the Apogee F2, or I'm sorry, A2. It's not quite as smooth as the Ultra, but it's the same principle. We're never going negative. At 172 meters, we're still not done getting the benefit. Okay. Uh, why is the so the, the thrust curve itself is dramatically different. They both start, they all start off roughly the same in the first, I think it's uh, seven one hundredths of a second. But after that, the Estes quickly jumps into its thrust spike. And the A2 is a longer, slower burn. So the effect of the piston is much different in reacting to that thrust spike. As a general rule, I can't say that smaller diameter is better. It really depends on the, uh, what I'll say, the starting state thrust curve of the motor that you're facing. What we've found is that reducing the diameter is very effective at dampening a strong thrust spike. So if you're starting with a motor that's got a high thrust spike like the A3, reducing the diameter is a substantial performance improvement. In the Ultras, there was no th uh, thrust spike, so we don't believe that reducing the diameter is going to be of any benefit. Uh, in your test stand, the uh, moving weighted piston head, is that the same size as the normal piston head? Uh, it, the diameter is the same size. The length is slightly different because of the weight. We have Does that to, affect the friction you have inside there? Uh, yes, I would contend there's a, a, a minor friction impact in here, but I think in the overall equations that would equate to uh, negligible. Uh, Patrick, are you over here? Anything? You want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, just a second. I want to repeat the question here from Patrick. You didn't quite catch that. Okay, Patrick, the question was, is the length of the piston used in the testing changing? And if so, is that friction impact that will affect our numbers in it? staged A to A, went with a 68-inch uh, long piston, 
uh, a little bit of initial volume, though at that weight, because this is much heavier than an FAI, we don't think that the initial volume is of much benefit. And our first model was ridiculously high, but lost track. It was basically too high, too quick, that the trackers were not able to keep up with it. The second one we flew was a more conventional uh, B motor, 18 millimeter, 68 inch piston. It did not go nearly as high, but it successfully closed track. And we were, I think, third. Other questions? Uh, Bob? Yeah, um, how much, uh, what were you assuming the weight of these FII models were when you were doing your 13 uh, millimeter test? Very good question. The weight we estimated ranged, uh, I think, from like 15 or 18 on grams on the light end to 40 grams on the heavy end. We went with an average between the two. Uh, we did, in the report, illustrate the Newton difference between the, the extreme on the weight end and if the model is a little bit heavier or lighter, we basically proved that during the piston travel, that difference is negligible. So that we went with an average that we think is close enough. Uh, first question in the back. That's the farthest we went on the 13 millimeter config configuration because at that point we had solved the problem. Uh, Matt, you had a question? I'll toss this one to you. Matt was asking if the propellant depletion weight impact was factored into our calculations. more of a factor, we're leaving the piston at seven one hundredths of a second. Okay. Okay, so we're out of time. Let's thank 